Hello, and welcome to Great.com Talks With. Today, we're talking with Michael Harold, Director of Policy and Advocacy at Western Center on Law and Poverty, an organization fighting to secure housing, healthcare, and a strong safety net for Californians living with low incomes. And if you're new to our podcast, please press subscribe button either on YouTube or your podcast app, because today we're going to learn about an organization that is fighting to end poverty in California. Hello, Michael. Welcome to Great.com Talks. We're excited to have you here. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. Could you describe Western Center on Law and Poverty for someone who is not familiar with your work? Well, um, uh, you know, we're legal service lawyers, and we advocate on behalf of our clients. So I think, you know, that's the best way to see it. People have problems, like when you have legal problems, you go to a lawyer and we try to fix them. And that's what we try to do, except we try to do it on a big scale. We don't work on individual cases. We work on big policy things that affect tens of thousands, even millions of people at one time. So that's really what we do. Our our job is to really change the policies that create and cause poverty. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, the um, analogy that you mentioned, it's uh, as uh, fixing problems, but not for one individual, but for the group of people, for society in general on a large scale. So the impact that can be done and uh, accomplishments can be made in the uh, legal uh, courts is impacting more and more lives of people in a positive direction, especially when it comes to ending poverty in California. Could you please tell us how big of an issue is poverty and wealth gap in California? It's an enormous problem. Um, almost one in five children in California live below what we call the federal poverty level, um, which is, you know, roughly people making less than $2,000 a month, a family of four. Um, so um, when children live in poverty, grow up in poverty, um, they have a whole lot of long-term outcomes um, that aren't good or positive for them. Um, they tend to have lower levels of education. Um, they tend to have lower earnings um, when they get older. They're more dependent on government programs and services in order to maintain, you know, basic existence. Um, so, you know, if we, we know that if we simply increase the amount of income and the amount of money that low-income kids have when they're young, we can reverse those outcomes. They can have higher earnings. They can get a college education. They can actually be a tax contributor and help others. Um, so income is really at the core of, of, um, of, of the development of young children and of our future. And so, um, and while we, we also advocate on behalf of, you know, low-income disabled individuals and senior citizens, um, you know, much of the poverty that you see in California is really focused in, in poor families and, in, um, and mostly people of color. Mm -hmm. When we think about California, we think about Hollywood, we think about big tech, we think about wealth and uh, California being one of the wealthiest states in United States and its economy, it's a quite a large and developed economy. But uh, given uh, the numbers that 20% of children in California live uh, below poverty line, it's quite shocking. Um, and the fact that uh, despite uh, being... Um, a quite economically developed state, the issue of poverty remains one of the urgent and one of the uh, key issues because, as you mentioned, uh, it impacts uh, minorities. It impacts people of color. It impacts other minorities. And when um, children are born to the families and raised in the families where um, they live in a poverty, then they don't have necessary access to education. They don't have necessary access to the same opportunities that their fellows have from a, a middle class or upper class. So it's quite um, urgent and quite important to make that distinction. How well, the number seems uh, quite high, so 20% on ch on, of children. Mm -hmm. And what is government, Californian government, is doing to resolve this issue and to make this gap as little as possible? Well, you know, it sounds really simple, but what we have to do is get more money into people's hands. 
And we can do it through a variety of mechanisms. You know, we have traditional um, sort of government support systems that give cash assistance to families and give nutrition assistance, food assistance, you know, on a regular basis. But increasingly, um, we're looking at other ways to transfer income to people using tax code, for example. So um, we are giving a tax, um, we're giving um, income to people through the tax code. Instead of paying taxes in, people are actually getting a $250 a month check um, uh, every month if they're low income now, um, if they have earnings from work. So um, our federal government under President Biden is a big champion of this. They've been um, they, they're going to begin this program in July, where every family now who's of low income means is going to get a $250 increase um, in, in their income. At the state level, our governor, one of the first things he did when he came into office was fund a child tax credit. So every family with children under the age of 30, incomes under $30,000 a year, now gets an automatic increase of $1,000 per child. So um, you know, those are the kind of programs that uh, transferring income to folks directly is really the place that we want to go. Um, you mentioned, you know, California is a very wealthy state. We also have a lot of poverty. Um, we're in a situation where because we have a lot of very, very wealthy people in our state, um, despite the pandemic, they're doing very well and they're paying more taxes in than we've ever seen before. Um, so we actually have a very, very large budget surplus. And the governor, to his credit, is taking a lot of that increased revenue that we're getting and giving it right back to working low-income families. So <clears throat> the governor has created um, another program to provide um, $600 and $500 checks going out to every family. We've done one round already. We're going to do another. Another way that we need to do this is by raising wages for people. Um, and California was the first state in the country, and we were proud to be a sponsor of the bill that raised the minimum wage in California to $15 an hour. So, you know, it's not going to be one solution that fixes this problem. We need to do a whole host of things to help lift people's incomes up so they get out of poverty and we eliminate these kind of poor outcomes that we're seeing for so many children in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about the government. There is um, a surplus in the budget and the government, uh, Californian government uh, is focusing on building the safety net on distributing um, the excess funds that they have for uh, children and families uh, living in the poverty, below the poverty line and making sure that they have uh, enough resources for um, food and housing. So that's very important. But the fact that you mentioned that there's um, the perfect solution uh, in order to um, end the poverty in California, it's not one uh, method. It's not one uh, action. Yeah. There should be several set of actions. And one can be, as you mentioned, uh, your organization uh, fought uh, to make $15 minimum wage. And you also are working on different things. But there is... Um, set of actions that need to be done. It's a complex issue and uh, requires complex, complex solutions in order uh, to fight it against till, um, till the end. As you are a um, uh, network of lawyers, your organization uh, provides legal services. Could you please tell us about your work and how do you access uh, justice to um, people from uh, low-income families? Well, we... At Western Center, we try to use a variety of tools to um, assist our clients. So, you know, we are lawyers, so we do bring lawsuits, and we sue federal government, the state government, county governments, private entities, if they're doing stuff that is violating the law and impacting our low-income clients negatively. So, you know, we're that's been always the you know, that was how we sort of started was doing law, doing lawsuits and suing people and holding them accountable. Um, but over time, we have developed other tools. Um, one of those tools is we do legislative advocacy, which is kind of what I do. I work in Sacramento, live and work in Sacramento, California, our state capital. And we have a very strong, active lobbying presence, advocacy presence at our state capital. 
So, you know, this week, for example, I'm spending a lot of time in hearings about how we're going to spend this big surplus and trying to make sure that we're getting as much money as we can to our low-income clients. Um, you know, again, we have a governor that's pretty committed to doing this kind of work, and we don't have to convince him that it's the right thing to do. But there's a lot of people out there who want this money, right? So we have to compete with everybody else. But, you know, we're pretty effective, and we have a really strong reputation among people in Sacramento, and they know that when we bring ideas forth, that there are going to be serious, credible ideas. So that's a big thing that we do. We do a lot of work at the state capitol and lobbying. And then, you know, the other thing that we do is that we have to make sure that once we pass these laws, that they actually go into effect and do the things that we want them to do. So, you know, we very closely monitor the way the government implements the laws. And, in, and we participate really actively with government to make sure that they do, they write them the right way and that they have the rules set the way that really is going to get um, the assistance that we're hoping to the people that need it the most. Um, so, you know, it's really a multi-layered uh, approach that we take, and we don't have just one strategy. We try to use a multiple, uh, and we also do a lot of work in coalition with a lot of other progressive organizations. We cannot get our work done by ourselves. We are not like some big giant Goliath that can just get, snap our fingers and get things done. You know, we have to work with labor unions and progressive groups and women's organizations and immigrant rights groups, um, a whole host of people have to come together to make change happen. And we're, we're pretty effective at building those kind of coalitions. Mm. You indeed use uh, several tools and uh, take into consideration uh, working with different stakeholders when it comes to the issues of poverty and um, fighting for justice for uh, people uh, from low-income families. And the fact that you work uh, closely uh, with the government and you are present in the hearings, so you are uh, voicing the concerns, you are voicing the needs of uh, your clients and people uh, from low-income families. So that's very important that uh, uh, the voice of uh, people is being heard and uh, you, um, your organization is one of those tools that can uh, transform, can build bridges um, between uh, the needs as well as the, between the, uh, the government. So that's very, very well, important. We, I would just add on to that, that yes, we do do a lot of testifying in committees and we do a lot of work in the, in the capital. But we also try to bring the impacted people into the process itself so that their voices can be directly heard by the people who are making decisions. So, you know, we'll bring low-income families and their mothers or, their, you know, their children into hearings and let them testify about what their life is like or letting a low-income senior or persons with disability, living with disability, testify about why they need more money in order to be able to afford to stay in their house and not become evicted and be homeless. So it's really important that policymakers hear the authentic voices of those who are impacted by the decisions that affect their lives. And we really try to center those families in our work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's very, very important to, as mentioned by you, uh, to hear authentic voices of uh, people affected by the issues uh, uh, that uh, in California and the fact that you are representing them and helping them um, to uh, be present in courts and be present uh, in front of the people, in, the, in front of the decision makers and raise their concerns is very important. Uh, besides providing access to justice, uh, you also work on issues such as healthcare and financial security. Could you please tell us uh, more in detail about your work in these areas? Sure. Um, so, um, excuse me. Um, you, know, um, you know, we believe that healthcare is a human right. And, um, you know, we're a state that obviously um, we're a state of immigrants. Um, you know, and it's all California's always, at least for the last 250 years, this has been a state of immigrants. Um, so, it, and you know, we have a lot of Latinos who live here, people, many of them born in Mexico. But we also, I mean, we have a very, very, the, the fastest growing part of our population are people from India. Um, we have many people um, uh, from Eastern European countries who have come to live in the United States, lots of people from Afghanistan now in California. Um, 
uh, we have a lot of a Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans. Who, so we have a society that's very mixed. And um, some people are citizens, some people are not citizens, some people are documented, some people are not documented. But as the pandemic has demonstrated, health and health concerns, you know, you know, viruses don't know about citizenship or documentation or whether you're a citizen, whether you have a right to the health care, um, you're, you're sick and you need help and you need assistance. And so we believe that every person in California deserves to have health care. Um, and no matter what their situation or status is. Um, and we feel the same way about benefits. You know, if, if some families are going to get child tax credits and benefits low, doing low income, we believe they should go to people who are undocumented, who are working just alongside the people who are documented. So, um, so I think healthcare for us is our main goal is to make sure that every single person has healthcare that is affordable to them and hopefully free, um, so that they don't have to worry about health and their family. Um, we do a lot of work also in the space of um, making sure that both government and the court system and, and oh, excuse me, and the and private corporations are not um, uh, running over our, our clients and taking money from them. So much of my day is spent trying to give people, make sure we get the money to people. And then part of my day is spent making sure that people aren't taking that money from my clients, right? So, so one thing that we see a lot in California, and this has been in the news, I think internationally, is you know, um, we have a lot of people, people, um, especially people of color, get pulled over, they get traffic tickets, they get violations, and sometimes these incidents escalate into death of people, as we saw in Minnesota last summer, and we've seen many, many times across the country. Um, but also, just for the average person, these fines and fees that we're assessing on people are prohibitively expensive. And they, they really have the effect of driving people into poverty. And also, you know, when, when corporations try to take money to, to get money back for debt that they suppose, people supposedly owe, often they're taking the money that's going to be the money that people need to buy food with or to pay the rent with or to keep the lights on so their children can study. So we really work actively in this space to try to make the laws fair for people and not so punitive. So that's another big piece of the work that we do at Western Center is making sure that there is access to justice and that the systems out there are not exploiting and taking money from poor people that they really can't afford to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, California is such a diverse state and everyone, um, as you mentioned, shall have access to healthcare, whether um, they are of a certain ethnicity or they are of a certain legal status. So everyone should have right, uh, should uh, has a right and uh, should be able uh, to practice it. And you mentioned that you are fo not only focusing on providing enough financial resources uh, for people to make, uh, to live a good life, And also you're focusing that the corporations and the systems that are in place are not taking those money away from people who actually need them. So it's very important that this is not one way program. This is like the two way solution that needs, that needs to be uh, implemented. Could you please uh, tell us about some of the recent cases that you have worked on and the impact that uh, you were able to accomplish? Gosh, uh... <laughs> That's, that's an easy question and a really hard question. Um, well, um, let me think. We just, we just won a case. We just won a case in the California Supreme Court um, that uh, eliminates people getting their driver's license suspended because they didn't show up to court when they were supposed to. So if you got a traffic ticket and you didn't show up, maybe you couldn't make it to court that day. Um, judges across California would just immediately suspend your driver's license, and then you can't drive, you can't go to work, and then you lose money. The next thing you know, you're poor. And so um, we brought a case um, against the court systems, which is kind of unusual, right? Usually when we go to court, we're suing the some bad guy or something. But this time we were actually suing the court, <laughs> telling the court that they were doing something bad. 
And it took us several years and we, you know, it was a very hard case to win, but we eventually won that case. And those kind of license suspensions are now a thing of the past. We have managed to get rid of a good chunk of those kind of license suspensions. And, um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've done very effectively in the last year during the pandemic is that, you know, millions of people lost their jobs, mostly low wage workers lost their jobs. Um, and so uh, immediately people had trouble paying the rent. You know, most people in California are renters. So they, they had trouble paying the rent. And when they couldn't pay the rent, the landlord was going to eviction. And so we were affected. Uh, we have been continuously affected in um, implementing a series of what we call moratoriums, preventing all eviction to people due to the pandemic. So this has been something that's been um, an enormous fight for us. And it's had, sometimes we have won victories with the courts. Sometimes we have won victories with the legislature. Um, and But to date, um, we have prevented been now 15 months of the pandemic, we have still maintained this moratorium and kept people in their home, even though in some cases people haven't been able to pay the rent for months. So this to us is the kind of work, I mean, we really try to work at this very basic level where the real issues of real people are being impacted. And this is just an example of the kind of stuff that we've been able to get done during the pandemic in the last year. Um, but there are countless examples more that we could share with you. But I, for the interest of time, I'll just provide those too. Yeah, indeed, the impact that you were able to accomplish uh, with those two indicated uh, cases is quite enormous, whether it's a moratorium or uh, whether it's fighting against the court system in general. So I can see the lives of people being in impacted in a positive way um, so they can live their lives uh, more uh, comfortably and not worry about either uh, eviction or their uh, driver's license being suspended for not being able uh, to show on uh, show on time. So that's uh, quite uh, interesting to see the wide range of projects um, that you work on. If someone would like to support Western Center on Law and Poverty, how can they do that? They can go to our website and we're at www.wclp.org. And uh, on there, there's a little button you can click on to make a donation to Western Center. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. The link to the Western Center on Law and Poverty's website will be provided in the description. So you viewing and listening can go to the website and familiarize yourself with the work that the organization is doing and make a contribution if you wish to. Thank you so much, Michael. It was wonderful to get to know you and the great work Western Center on Law and Poverty is doing. Thank you very much again for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to have this discussion with you. For you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please press like and share button because this will show the YouTube and podcast algorithm that this conversation is important, that we need to fight to end poverty. Thank you and see you in the next episode.